Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Zaidar. This program comes to you from the Center for Security Strategy and Policy Research. CESPA is an autonomous policy research center housed in the University of Lahore. It tackles issues that impact contemporary security and strategic developments. This program is part of that effort. Let's get to this episode, which is about a broad range of issues: political Islam, Afghanistan, France, the colonial past, immigration, problems of assimilation, and Europe's new approach to security given Russia's invasion and the reemergence of bloc geopolitics. And I have just the right expert for this menu. Professor Olivier Roy, Roy, a political scientist and a prolific writer, is currently joint chair at the Robert Schuman Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute, and a junk professor at the EUI School of Transnational Governance. But in our part of the world, anyone who has read up on political Islam and Afghanistan must know Professor Roy. His first book, Islam and Resistance in Afghanistan, which is the labor of over five years of field research during the Soviet presence in Afghanistan, came out in 1986. Another book, The Failure of Political Islam, which was published in 1998, made two interesting points: the Islamists are pretty close to the third worldism of the 60s, and those marching beneath Islam's green banners are akin to the Reds of yesterday, with similarly dim prospects of success. Another book whose French title can be translated as "Secularism versus Islam." I have actually haven't read this one, but I read reviews of uh, on this, and this is about France. Roy argued that contemporary Islam is deeply secularized, including in its most radical forms. It does not represent an exception and poses no more of a problem than other religions. In a more recent book, "Is Europe Christian?" Roy stressed that Europe today is secular. and multicultural and most right wing nationalists ignore or reject christian teaching even as they employ it towards political ends the list of his books is long so without further ado let me bring him in for our discussion welcome to the program professor roy let's start with uh, closer to home home meaning pakistan and where your uh, your career as as an anthropologist and political scientist began as i said you know many decades ago so from that moment to now afghanistan having gone through multiple transitions and terrible incessant war internal as well as the one imposed from outside has this all been a wastage uh, you know uh, something that you could have foreseen or something that surprises you because it's like the wheel coming full circle again and in many ways not the way that the afghanistan society used to be well you know the, the starting point of this uh, 45 years of uh, 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 civil war and the struggles for inventions etc started with the communist coup in 1978 and uh, at that time i was convinced that um, the resistance movement with which was both a nationalist movement and also a muslim not islamic necessarily but muslim uh, uh, movement against a foreign intervention would um, i would say uh, 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 go to some sort of new stable afghanistan Uh, but as soon as the soviet troops left afghanistan in uh, 80, uh, 90 uh, 89 89 yeah, uh, i saw the uh, starting of a civil war between the mujahideen and from that point i became uh, pessimistic you know? uh, uh, because this uh, civil war was not an ideological civil war it was more based you know on traditional ethnic tribal uh, 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 divides in afghanistan it was a struggle for power and not a struggle for identity of afghanistan uh, and of course uh, the surrounding powers and the uh, global powers didn't help you know Uh, Afghanistan became a stage of uh, geopolitics and it's still the case it's still the case uh, i think that the, the, the big mistake uh, now i would say that because at the time i was in favor of the military intervention in 2001 you know uh, 
because I thought that um, uh, the Afghan people would be fed up by uh, 20 years of war and that there will be some sort of a consensus in Afghanistan to rebuild a stable uh, state. But no, no, the, um, uh, the Western intervention uh, uh, was a big failure in terms of uh, 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 state building. You know, the very concept of state building was a mistake. You know, the idea was to uh, import from abroad a technocratic model of a state with state institutions, constitutions, law, legal systems, and so on. And it was a complete failure because it uh, ignored uh, Afghan history and I would say the political anthropology of Afghanistan. So it was a complete mistake. Uh, so in this sense, uh, the withdrawal of the, uh, the Western troops uh, three years ago was inevitable. You know. Now, right. let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I recall, I recall uh, you were at Brookings. Uh, I happened to be at Brookings at the time. And this was, of course, uh, the height of uh, the, the U.S. invasions, uh, Afghanistan first and then Iraq. And I remember you making this point uh, back then that this project uh, is, is not well conceived. But, but here's the thing. I won't go back and I'm a little surprised that since given your, your field uh, research and, you know, you were with the Northern Alliance, Ahmad Shah Massoud, and you, you were, I think, at three different times, if I remember correctly, for almost over a period of 18 months. Uh, you, you spent there. I'm surprised that, uh, you know, you did not think that it could degenerate into civil war because, uh, you know, uh, ethnically, in terms of if we go back to the PDPA, the Hulk and Percham factions with the Khalkis more uh, ethnic non-Pashtuns and the, you know, the, sorry, the Khalkis with predominance of Pashtuns and the Parchamis being, you know, non-Pashtun. So that kind of power struggle that we saw unfold, even during the PDPA regimes, was likely to play it out after the Soviet withdrawal. Sure, sure. Uh, but the, the hub was that uh, uh, there could be, um, uh, I would say, an agreement between the tradition all Pashtun aristocratic elites, you know, uh, from the south, and the uh, new Mujahideen commanders. And in fact, it didn't work. You know. uh, uh, the old aristocracy, as represented by Hamid Karzai, for instance, had no more any legitimacy inside Afghanistan. You know, they, they were too, uh, too long outside Afghanistan. They had no real legitimacy. And the Mujahideen commanders, in fact, who took the power, uh, were unable uh, to uh, um, uh, to retake, you know, the traditional uh, uh, Afghan conception of a central state because there was a central state in Afghanistan. You know. The monarchy did build a working state, maybe a weak state, but it was working uh, in the fifties, in the sixties, and even the seventies. And in fact, I would say the big word, unfortunately, was corruption. Corruption from the start. And the corruption was made easy because of the huge amount of money uh, uh, which was poured inside Afghanistan by the West. You know, the idea was to help to stabilize uh, the country and to stabilize it from a political point of view. But if you uh, uh, give, if you push, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, in a poor country, uh, then you immediately create. Uh, uh, some sort of uh, inflation of corruption, and from the beginning right. of there was corruption. Uh, so right. I think and you know, it's interesting. It's it's interesting that that the you know U.S. Uh, uh, agencies themselves were reporting uh, that there was very little uh, audit and accounting of where the money was going. But uh, let me take you to another topic because you know, I mean, we could actually discuss Afghanistan for the next three hours. Uh, but I started with Afghanistan because I just wanted to get a sense from you of, you know, how you have seen the, the, the country uh, unfold and, and the situation in the country unfold 
So, you know, four decades down the road, how do you look at it? But another issue on which you have done a lot of research and writing is political Islam. And I mentioned your book, The Failure of Political Islam, which came out in 98. So from then to now, give me your sense of whether you think that the two central points uh, or arguments in your book, one about the third worldism of 60s and the other about the greens of today being the reds of yesterday, uh, does it still hold? Ha do you think anything has changed? Would you uh, re revise your, your thesis about uh, political Islam or do you think it still holds? It still works. And in a sense, it's confirmed by the events, you know, by the fact that, you know, as I said, there are only two possible directions. One is democratization, uh, because you cannot uh, rule a country uh, with a political ideology. So either you uh, accept democracy or you go for some sort of despotism, of uh, uh, dictatorship. And in terms of Islam, uh, either you uh, turn uh, Islam as a political ideology, and it's, uh, it doesn't work, you know, because it doesn't fit with the way people believe, with the way people experience and live their own religion, their own uh, uh, Islam. Uh, and the second direction uh, uh, is um, uh, Salafism, you know, fundamentalism. Uh, the idea that, okay, uh, an Islamic state doesn't work, so let's have Islam now in our everyday life, and let's push for Sharia, let's push for uh, fighting against blasphemy, let's push for, uh, uh, to, um, to make the local people um, uh, accept the norms, you know, of Sharia in their everyday life. So, uh, and it's explained why from the uh, 90s we had a big development Salafism uh, from, uh, I would say, Morocco to, uh, to Pakistan. Yeah. And it didn't work uh, also uh, uh, because um, uh, uh, Salafism at the end, it's a purely legal system uh, and it misses uh, spirituality. It misses what people want to find in religion, that's a spirituality. So the two models, political Islam, the Muslim Brothers, for instance, and Salafism were unable to provide a model of uh, ruling. Uh, so for the Islamists, either they go to democracy, like Hanoushi, uh, Nahda in Tunisia, and they, uh, it was not double speak, you know, it was not double language, they really uh, accepted democratic rules. Uh, but they were unable to uh, rule the country in an efficient way, and they lost the elections, and they accepted, you know, losing the elections. So they they, they played against the democratic rule, uh, uh, but in a sense, it's a political failure because they were unable to deliver when they were in charge. In Egypt, it's a bit different because um, the Muslim Brothers won the elections. But then uh, uh, they were also unable to rule the country. And then there was uh, some sort of a military coup, uh, which is also some sort of a failure. So now if we go, you know, from uh, 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 if we look at the uh, uh, bigger, uh, greater uh, uh, middle, uh, middle East, we see that nowhere uh, the Islamists have been able to deliver. And the only country but, which but, is... But here's the thing. Here's the thing, Professor Roy. Let me interject here. Uh, it's quite clear that the secular governments, and I am using the term purely in contradistinction to the Islamists, uh, and the secular secularists may not be secular in, in the sense in which the term is understood in, in Europe, for instance, or in France, but their inability to govern in any democratic way is also uh, largely responsible, if you will, for the kind of reaction. Now, that reaction can be in different ways. It can be like, you know, the way the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, you know, reacts, or it can be the way in which uh, protesters in the Tahrir Square uh, reacted, or it could be... Uh, 
who was Zizi, who self-immolated himself in Tunisia. So the basic issue, and you know, correct me if I have misunderstood you, that much of your work basically looks at the, the institution institutionalization or lack thereof of the you know governance structures because whether it is whether the marker is islam or some other ideology the fact is that everything is unfolding in today's modern world which is very different from the old sort of manifestations of any religion be it judaism christianity or islam do you think I've understood uh, that argument correctly? Yeah, um, the, we should not oppose, you know, secularism versus religion. It doesn't work like that. Uh, if you look at Iran, for instance, uh, uh, the so-called Islamic Republic of Iran has created, has produced the most secular society in the Middle East. People uh, go less and less to the mosque, uh, some convert to other religions, some decided to become atheists, etc., etc. It's a most secular society, uh, uh, except that the regime is, of course, a religious uh, one. Uh, and in uh, uh, the, the other countries, we couldn't say that um, uh, the uh, ruling regimes are secular. You know? uh, first, they claim, you know, to... Uh, to um, push for the uh, national traditions, and among the traditions you have, of course, Islam. Uh, they uh, claim to be very conservative in terms of uh, 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 morals, for instance. Uh, uh, just an example, you know, in Egypt, uh, uh, during the uh, year of the rule of the Muslim Brothers, you had no trials of homosexuals for one year. But as soon as the Muslim brother lost the power, then you had again, you know, suits against homosexuals and trials of homosexuals. So you, we cannot say that you, on one hand we have a liberal secularism versus a dogmatic Islamism. It's far more complex than that. What we have now is, I would say, a diversification of the religious field. No. The Islamists, the Muslim brothers, they don't have anymore the monopoly of religion in politics. Religion in politics, now everybody uh, can handle religion in, in politics. And people are more and more, you know, looking for their own way to be religious. They, they don't like, you know, the, the government or parties to explain them how to be a good Muslim, for instance. So, so we have a paradoxical democratization of the religious field. Uh, but this democratization is not expressed in uh, most of uh, in, in political terms. No. We have a, a decline of uh, 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 democratization in most of the uh, uh, Middle East countries since the Arab Spring. Now we have a conservative backlash. Uh, but the conservative backlash is not a religious backlash. Uh, so right. we have, I would say, uh, uh, disentanglement uh, uh, between religion and politics, and not a decline of religion. And I think that is something very important. You know. uh, secularization yeah. the, here is a political secularization. It doesn't mean necessarily that the society are more secular, but the people right. uh, uh, I think that's uh, want a, to separate religion and politics. I think that's a, that's a very uh, important and uh, nuanced point. And I think it's also uh, a very good moment to sort of uh, jump over all the way to France. Uh, and so I, I did a program uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on France. I had uh, two uh, French experts. And we were talking about the French idea and sort of contrasting it uh, with how the British look at it, you know, in terms of multiculturalism. Whereas in France, the stresses uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, French in the sense of reinventing yourself, you know, a rebirth of sorts. Now, I recall uh, fairly vividly that in 2005, when there were riots uh, around Paris, you were arguing that these are not because, the, the, these are not the expression of religiosity or the fact that, you know, since the Muslims are predominantly protesting, so it's got something to do with Islam. 
and you were talking about the various other social political economic grievances and i recall that another eminent french uh, scholar gilles kepel was arguing exactly the opposite of what you were arguing so i want you to give me a sense of from then 2005 to now what we saw unfortunately after the uh, the rather gratuitous uh, killing of a uh, 17 year old uh, do you think the problem still persists and if it does how can it be addressed it's exactly the repetition you know of the riots of 2005 uh same cause same effects um, a young guy dies um, uh, while confronting the police uh, and then uh, uh, the local youth revolt and burn their own neighborhood that's uh, the, the big issue uh, uh, in 2005 we were able to see you know some imams uh, some guys with a beard and a, a white uh, kameez and shalwar uh, 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 going to the streets and trying to Uh, uh, appease the youth and so on. So now it's finished. It's finished. There is there has been no religious people uh, going to the streets as religious people. The uh, riots were totally, you know, uh, disconnected with religion. Uh, and I'm not sure it's a good thing, by the way, uh, uh, because there is such a pressure uh, from the uh, government and from the majority of the public opinion. to push religion you know into the private and to prevent you know imams and uh, believers to play a role as imams and believers that it has, it has succeeded in a sense you know the imams uh, they stayed in the mosques uh, during the riots and they of they opposed the violence of course you know but nobody was trying to speak with them nobody was interested by what the imams could have uh, 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 of influence among the youth it's finished you know. so the paradox is that this process of uh, secularization has worked but it doesn't has at all uh, smooth uh, uh, the resentment of the youth so the, the problem is here is a purely Uh, I would say um, um, it's not socio-economic. It's more complex than that. It's a real problem of generation. Uh, 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 the rioters were youth, young, and very young. You know, uh, from 13 to 17, to 17, 18, and so and so, younger than uh, in 2005. So we have a generational problem here. You know. The parents have no control on this youth. The parents uh, are out. Most of the families are not working very well, so uh, uh, so it's a problem. I would say of deculturation. It's not a cultural so, so, so protest. Let me, let, can can you clarify? I mean, you're making a very important point. Are you saying that the traditional values uh, among the families, uh, and I'm talking about you know the Berbers, uh, the North Africans, Algerians, uh, French citizens, but are you saying that those traditional family values those safety networks have basically disintegrated over the over uh, a period of you know two or three decades yeah yeah and the uh, the which is the official reading like that of my colleague G- Kepel, is that the Salafis are controlling the neighborhood? That they are imposing, you know, uh, religious norms on the people in the streets and so. And it's totally wrong. Totally wrong. If the Salafi were in charge, we would not have such riots. You know. uh, they would never have let uh, young people burn uh, uh, the uh, the cars of the local people, uh, 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 the shops, and things like that. So uh, these riots show. Uh, they show two things: a desocialization and a deculturation of uh, this lost generation. Uh, That's a very important point. That's a very yeah, important point. But I point also too. want, I also want to bring in another thing, another point that you stress. You know, in that book, uh, uh, secularism versus Islam, and you say that you know there is something specific to French society. uh where uh you know the state would like to make secularism a kind of civil religion requiring citizens to adhere to a body of common values you know uh is that a problem in terms of dealing with this problem that we're talking about 
Yeah, it's a problem at two levels. First, the state cannot deliver. When you say, you know, laicite, secularism, French secularism means freedom, tolerance, happiness, it's not true. <laughs> because uh, the, this youth, these disenfranchised youth, uh, they have problem with the police, they have a problem with uh, finding a job, with racism, and so on and so So they think that the uh, state is cheating them, you know. They are promising them uh, uh, if they accept the, the laicite, the uh, official secularism, that life will be better, and life is not better. The second point is that uh, uh, by fighting, you know, uh, the role of religion in social life, uh, the state is destroying uh, some, I would say, uh, uh, social uh, uh, binds, you know, some endeavors by religious people to do something. For instance, to have a, a post-school uh, 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 associations where you uh, you help the children who have problems in school, for instance, yeah. uh, 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 sport clubs, yeah, uh, which are managed by believing uh, Muslims. Yeah. And for, uh, for instance, recently, the government launched launch an inquiry into the sports club, the uh, sporting clubs, which were accused to be Islamists. You know? They didn't find anything. They didn't find Kalashnikov, they didn't find Koran, they didn't find money, and so on and so on. But by putting a pressure on the uh, social networks managed by Muslims, you know, uh, they contribute to uh, uh, accentuate, to accelerate the uh, uh, crisis of social uh, uh, binds. You know? Uh, and we should not forget that in the uh, 50s, for instance, the Catholic Church played a role uh, uh, in these uh, uh, sporting clubs, uh, uh, local associations, support for families, and so on. Now, the Catholic Church is in total uh, disarray, it's a huge crisis. But it's not necessarily a bad thing if we see Muslim believers trying also, you know, to help you know, to restore uh, a social solidarity in the destitute neighborhoods. But they are under the pressure and the suspicion of the police. And that's a big problem. Right. So uh, one gets a sense, and uh, correct me uh, if, uh, if this sense is wrong, that from the far right, which metaphorically speaking, so, you know, uh, the likes of Marine Le Pen and others. Mm. Of course, she's not the only one. Mm. There are others also. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in the previous election also, the election before that also, there was a sense that, oh, Emmanuel Macron is the bulwark against this far-right uh, victory. But increasingly, it seems that Macron himself, in terms of legislation, which is not particularly, uh, you know, which which essentially uh, takes away individual liberties like surveillance and the rest of it, and also the use of the national police, seems to be uh, getting closer to the far right uh, than away from them. And so the only ones that are left uh, standing, uh, so to speak, are the left parties, which are still talking about, you know, various things that are going wrong. That's one thing. It's the other thing is that there's still the issue of the Muslimness of these rioters, but never the, you know, re religion does not come into protests like, for instance, the Yellow Vest or the protests on the pension fund reform. So there is still this idea to bring in or flag the otherness of the, the mm. Algerian or Berber or North African French mm. and tag them as Muslims. So give me uh, your sense of whether these observations are correct. The problem is, uh, which is typically a French problem, it's dealing with religion in general, not just Islam. But now, because the other religions are on decline, you know, the only visible religion uh, uh, is Islam. So we have a conjunction between a traditional anti-religious bias 
Pas en France. And I would say an anti-Islam, uh, uh, anti-immigration bias. So the two bias are now in uh, uh, conjunction, which explains why well, a part of the left you know, uh, uh, is now strongly anti-Islam also, you know, because it's uh, uh, because they are anti-religious by historical uh, tra tradition. Uh, but if we look at the uh, uh, speeches of uh, Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour, the extreme right recently, about the riots, they don't speak about Islam because they, they are not stupid, you know. They understood that there is nothing Islamic in the riots. So they speak about immigration. <laughs> they say the problem is immigration. But, uh, so basically, so problem, it's, a, it's, a, it's a circuitous approach. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an indirect uh, approach. To, uh, the, the rioters, you know, the young guys, they are third generation. It's their great parents who were migrants, mm -hmm. but they are not migrants at all. And the new migrants doesn't, uh, uh, didn't take part in, in, in the riots. Uh, so we, uh, the problem of integration is complex. It worked for middle classes. We have now an important Muslim uh, uh, dimension in the middle classes. I mean, if you go to a French hospital, you look at the names of the uh, uh, surgeons, doctors, and so, and you have a lot of Muslim names. Same thing for the lawyers, same thing for the bankers, same thing for the journalists, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et but these people who accede to the uh, middle classes, they don't want to be perceived as Muslim. You know? They are quite individualist, you know? and they don't want to be notified with the destitute neighborhoods, even if they were born in these destitute neighborhoods. So the problem of these destitute neighborhoods, they have no leadership. They have no intellectuals. They have no cadres, you know. Uh, uh, the people who succeed, they leave uh, the destitute neighborhood, which explains why these young guys are without guidance. You know, they have no uh, uh, adults. Uh, 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 and as I said, you know, the fathers are absent. Uh, uh, there is a problem of uh, uh, um, uh, solidity of the this families, etc., etc. Et this is a very, uh, uh, this is a very uh, important point. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm struck by this point because, you know, to the east of Pakistan, uh, we have a very large Muslim population in India. And the uh, Muslim Indian intellectuals, for the most part, uh, behave exactly in the manner that you talked about with reference to the French Muslims who have made it good in life. And, you know, gone out of the ban news and, you know, generally sort of, you know, uh, not really linking up with the community from where uh, they have risen. But let's talk about, uh, you know, Christianity. Uh, you've, you've written about that also uh, with reference to Europe. But let's talk about Christianity with reference to uh, France. And you make some interesting points with reference to libertarianism and hedonism uh, and and you say that you know these are things that that are tearing apart the fabric of the society so give us a sense of what the argument is with reference to christianity in europe well i would say it's not just in france it's all in the west until the 60s uh, the dominant uh, uh, vision of uh, 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 humanity, the values, you know, uh, uh, the values, of the Western values were secularized Christian values until the 60s. The conception of the family, the role of women, uh, 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 the rejection of homosexuality, etc. All that, you know, it was Christian without religion. But in this, from the 60s, we have now a new culture the culture of the 60s, which is based on individualism, freedom, and hedonism. It's a fact. No, I am not saying it's bad, I am not nostalgic, no, but it's a fact. And at the beginning, these new values were from the left, uh, from the uh, uh, hippies. But now, no, these values are dominant. So we see how in Europe, for instance, uh, even the uh, rightist uh, conservative government they have uh, uh, accepted uh, the right for abortion, the right for same-sex marriages, etc., etc. In Europe, 
In the USA, it's a bit different. So the right is far more conservative. But in Europe, the right, including the populists, including the extreme right, they are not very conservative in terms of uh, family values, you know, in terms of morality, everyday morality. Uh, their personal life, I will not give you example, but their personal life is a normal uh, 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 non-Christian uh, uh, family life. All of them, if I can say that. Okay. Uh, um, so uh, uh, the church had a problem, you know, with that. The, the church understood uh, the issue from the beginning, you know. Um, so. But now, the, the, uh, with the uh, last popes, the church fought a rearguard battle. The, the church was fighting against abortion, against same-sex marriage, and they lost the battle. And the, the, the liberal Christians, they became more liberal than Christians, so now they are out of the uh, uh, landscape. Uh, and then you had the crisis of pedophilia in the church, which has, of course, delegitimized uh, uh, the church. So a huge crisis uh, in the church, in the churches in general, including the Anglican church. And people are no more going uh, to mass. No? Uh, in Europe, except Poland, but in Europe, uh, less than 5% of the people go regularly to church. Less than 5%. No. A majority right. now of the Europeans say that they are no, you know, that they have uh, uh, no religious affiliations. They might believe in God or things like that, but they, they claim not to. So, have, so, so uh, 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 let, me, let me ask you this, uh, Professor Roy, let me ask you this. How do you think this has impacted uh, society? Uh, families uh, and you know families are also safety networks in many ways uh, you've seen that you've been uh, in our part of the world long enough to know you know Pakistan very well you know Afghanistan Iran the Middle East so they also provide safety networks so how has this impacted uh, the social values and do you think for better or for worse well, we have a, a crisis of social binds, you know. Uh, it's not just because of the new values. It's because of uh, the very different things. One is, of course, uh, neoliberalism. Uh, neoliberalism as an economic uh, uh, and financial uh, vision of the world uh, considers that uh, uh, there are only individuals. You know? Individuals who are responsible of their own fate. And that you build your on life, you know, uh, depending on your own uh, what you wish, you desire, the desire, and so on. So, neoliberalism ignores any kind of community, any kind of family, any kind of uh, 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 you know social uh, uh, grouping. They don't care. They don't care. We have internet, and an internet. You don't speak with your real neighbor. You don't speak with the shopkeeper in front of your home. You speak with the people who are like you. Uh, uh, so we ignore the diversity of the world, the diversity of the society, and you, uh, uh, yeah, you socialize with yourself because you socialize with people who are like you, and so you tend to distress and even to hate the people who are not like you. Uh, uh, and then we have, of course, uh, migrations in every direction, you know, uh, uh, which has put, you know, we we at contributed to a, what I call a deterritorialization of societies. Now, uh, uh, so it's not just a matter of change of values. Uh, we have a general crisis of the social bind, of the social link. Uh, and the nation, right. the nation state is no more the, the place where you can express you know, uh, uh, your opinions and vote for uh, 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 the, um, the government. Because the government is no more governing. Uh, 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 nation states are in crisis. Uh, Brussels, I'm in favor of Europe, you know, I am for a united Europe. But uh, uh, it's clear that uh, the European government in Brussels is not a real government, it's a bureaucracy. Uh, uh, which is efficient, but it's a bureaucracy. You cannot identify, you know, uh, with them. And so we have more generally a crisis of culture of the very right. concept of culture. Yeah. Uh, 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 so it makes me a bit pessimistic. 
because it's not just about politics and values, you know, it's about what makes a society. Right. Okay. Uh, Professor Roy, uh, you're also a public intellectual and obviously, among other things, you look at politics and also geopolitics. So before I close this program, I want to ask you, uh, just at the NATO summit in Vilnius, and Sweden and Finland joined. So uh, the Baltic Sea is now essentially a NATO lake, uh, with the exception of Russia. Uh, and the entire sort of ganging up is against Russia. Do you believe that the current approach of isolating Russia or attempting to isolate Russia is something that is useful? Or do you think that uh, the prognosis for this kind of approach is not particularly uh, positive? Well, I think that uh, uh, Russia made a big mistake in invading Ukraine. Now. Uh, right. And it, um, uh, the results were very paradoxical because uh, the Europeans were afraid uh, of the military power of Russia. So they rushed to support Ukraine, they rushed to join NATO, and now NATO is stronger than ever. Now. Uh, and so Putin has lost, uh, not necessarily on the field, but he, he, from a strategic point of view, he has lost because what he want, wanted to prevent, the extension of NATO, is already here. Okay. And now, uh, uh, what to do? You know? uh, and the problem is that uh, uh, what is to be negotiated? That's the real problem now. Uh, uh, I think there should be a change in Russia, not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, a change of uh, regime or uh, leaders and so, but a change of approach. As long as Russia didn't recognize the real independence of Ukraine, there will be no negotiation. Uh, now we have no interest in the collapse of Russia. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was not well managed. The uh, present war is a consequence of the collapse of the, uh, the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, I was in the Soviet Union during the uh, collapse, and, you know, it was a traumatism for the people, a real trauma, because they suddenly, you know, everything was changed, you know, no government, new borders, new languages, and so and so. And uh, the people, uh, it, they became very anxious. Huh? Uh, they didn't uh, get a better life at all, at least for the first 10 years of uh, uh, independence. They lost uh, historical memory. Uh, they lost the logic, I would say, of uh, their life. Uh, and it was a disaster. Uh, now we should avoid that. Um, uh, a collapse of Russia would be a catastrophe. Uh, right. Uh, so so on this point, let me, let me, let me pick up this point uh, quickly. So Putin uh, thinks, and you know, frankly, he has certain valid reasons to think that. For instance, in 2008, when uh, George Bush talked about you know the possibility of Georgia uh, getting into NATO, uh, Putin invaded Georgia, and so we know Abkhazia as you know uh, is. is part of the de facto Russian territory. And similarly, in other instances, there's a sense that, you know, NATO expansion is essentially to squeeze Russia. I agree with you that his decision to invade Ukraine was, was not very smart. But my question still remains in terms of prognosis. I mean, agreed that he made a mistake he wanted to avoid NATO expansion, but he ended up getting NATO expanded. But what is the prognosis? I mean, if you cannot have Russia as part of Europe's collective security, then there's going to be a constant tension between Russia, uh, which is now very close to China and, you know, part of the emerging bloc, challenging the US-led bloc. So it seems to me that for world security, uh, the prognosis doesn't uh, appear good, especially at a time when we need cooperative strategies on climate change and pandemics and a number of other things. I agree with you. Uh, we 
the root of mistakes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the extension of NATO was not on the agenda of the Europeans. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe of some Americans, but not the Europeans, except the Poles, probably. But Western Europe was not in favor. Western Europe was doing a lot of business with Russia, was dependent of Russia in terms of gas. Uh, uh, as you know, many of our politicians were very close to Putin. Uh, they were part you know, of the uh, big business uh, of Russia, and so and so. Uh, our populist extreme right uh, was very uh, supportive of uh, Putin. So Putin has a lot of uh, soft power, efficiency of power in Western Europe. Uh, and he lost all that uh, uh, in one day uh, by uh, invading uh, Ukraine. And what we realize now is that Russia is far weaker than uh, uh, expected. We were fearing a strong Russia. And now we see that, yes, Russia is weak. The, the story of the Wagner group you know, uh, uh, going in one day you know, uh, close to Moscow, it's incredible. Who would have uh, 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 imagined that uh, two years ago? You know, it's not incredible. So now I think, and you're right, we, uh, the issue is to bring Russia back you know, into a security system. Uh, 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 sure, sure. Now, how to do that? And you have two uh, visions. One is to say uh, put, uh, Russia has to be first militarily defeated you know, in Ukraine, and then we will uh, negotiate. And the other is to say there couldn't be a military victory. Mm -hmm. And we should start negotiations now. now. Um, right. uh, and to be, uh, we know that there are negotiations. The, the interesting thing is that um, it's a, a uh, Pope, you know, who is probably the more active uh, in uh, negotiations now because he refused uh, to reject Russia. And uh, the Catholic Church is maintaining channels of communication with both Moscow and Kiev. Uh, the Cardinal Soupy, for instance, uh, is in touch with both the Ukrainians and the Russia. But uh, right. as uh, Stalin said, the Vatican, how many divisions? You know? Uh, but at least uh, uh, there are channels of uh, uh, negotiations and discussions, and I think except, that this should be maintained. Except that uh, you know the the conditions for a war termination strategy uh, does not exist. They do not exist either in the case of Russia or in the case of Ukraine. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Professor Roy, for being on the program. And as I said, we discussed a broad range of issues. Of course, we've, we've just kind of flagged all these issues. Each one of these issues can be debated uh, for a very long time. But sure. uh, thank you once again for being on the program. I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. This is all from this episode. If you like the discussion, click on the subscribe button. That helps us bring you quality discussions. Until our next episode, goodbye and stay safe.